In this case, I would be very surprised if the Israelis did not use the F-35, which is, of course, a stealth aircraft. In that case, there's a very good chance that Syria and Russia were not even necessarily aware that there were Israeli aircraft in the sky until the bombs were already falling. <clears throat> And, and so in terms of the response we've seen from Iran, I mean, they had a number of options. Some people speculated they may attack a consulate and embassy of Israel, almost a kind of tit for tat response. Why do you think they chose to launch an attack on Israel itself? And how do you think it will be viewed in Iran, given that really it didn't have much um, effect in terms of in terms of damage? Yeah, I think that the Iranians were trying to have a trying to make a successful attack that they hoped would deter Israel from further uh, attacks on their commanders overseas, advising their uh, proxy and partner network in the axis of resistance. Of course, I don't think that theory is actually going to work. We're already seeing reports that Israel will. <clears throat> retaliate against Iran for these attacks. Now Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio. I'm James Hansen. And today we're talking about Israel, Iran and the latest situation in the Middle East. And I'm delighted to be joined by Brian Carter, an analyst for the Critical Threats Project at the American Enterprise Institute. He focuses on Iran's activity across the Middle East. Brian, really appreciate your time. Welcome to Frontline. Thanks for having me. I mean, where to begin, really? I suppose, first of all, if you could just give me your assessment of, of what we've seen over the last few days. Yeah, sure. So obviously, on Saturday, April 13th, Iran launched hundreds of drones, ballistic missiles and cruise missiles targeting Israel. Uh, several ballistic missiles impacted near a few Israeli military bases. Uh, so they were not the Iranians were not targeting <clears throat> Uh, civilian sites, but rather military targets. How well did the Iron Dome, the, the much vaunted Iron Dome of Israel, cope? Well, it's hard to tell exactly how well the Iron Dome coped, but I think it's important to note that the Israeli air defenses are more than just the Iron Dome, especially in this case. And, you know, just to draw us out a little bit, of course, a lot of the systems, particularly the drones, that the Iranians used are also used by Russia in its war in Ukraine. And so <clears throat> what we saw was some of the advantages that the Israelis have compared to the Ukrainians, which I don't think the Iranians fully accounted for. So in the first instance, you have the Israeli Aero system, which is a anti-ballistic missile system that they use to shoot down some of the ballistic missiles. But also Israel's allies in the region were able to help intercept drones and missiles over the rest of the Middle East before they even got close to Israel's borders uh, using fighter aircraft and other capabilities. And of course, this is not an advantage uh, that Ukraine has. It doesn't have the fighter aircraft capable of carrying out this mission right now, nor does it have the geographic buffer uh, that the rest of the Middle East gives to Israel. And that's a really good point about the way that Israel's allies also played a key role here. I mean, had it not been for the US and indeed Jordan and the UK and others helping to shoot down some of these drones and missiles, would we be talking about a very different situation? Would the damage have been far worse? It's certainly hard to tell, but I think it's important to kind of point out what the allies actually did in this case. So in the case of Jordan, there are reports that Jordanian aircraft shot down dozens of Iranian munitions over Jordanian airspace. Of course, the United States did the same with its suite of air defense systems in the Middle East. And there are reports that the British, uh, as well as the French, also assisted in the uh, in the air defense of Israel. <laughs> and just to go back to that comparison with what we're seeing in Ukraine and with Russia, the specific tactics were quite similar as well, weren't they, in terms of trying to overwhelm the, the air defenses? Yeah, right. No, exactly. And I think part of why that is, is because the Iranians are looking at the Russian use of the Shahed drone, for example, as well as the Russian ballistic and cruise missiles against Ukraine and, and drawing lessons from that. So if you look at the structure of this strike package, the composition, the, the number of drones, ballistic missiles and cruise missiles, as well as how they were timed to enter Israeli airspace, there are a lot of similarities with how the uh, Russians conduct these attacks in Ukraine. So 
Of course, there are hundreds of cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, and drones that were launched in this attack, but they were launched in waves. So they were timed so that as the drones and cruise missiles began to enter Israeli airspace, they would distract the Israeli air defenses and the ballistic missiles would actually get through. So as you're looking at the strike package, the ballistic missiles are the component that Iran believed would strike home. And this is really important because that's how Russia structures a lot of its strike packages as well. But if you look at the comparison between Ukraine's success in intercepting uh, <clears throat> drones and missiles with or sorry, the ballistic missiles specifically, compare that with Israel's success, it's night and day. So the Ukrainians average about a 16% intercept rate on ballistic missiles. The Israeli intercept rate on Saturday was over 90%. So while the Iranians were learning this lesson from the Russians in Ukraine, they probably calculated that, yes, the Israeli air defenses are going to be more successful than Ukraine's, but I doubt that they expected that Israel's air defense structure would be just as effective as it actually ended up being. Again, this goes home and really drives home the point about Ukraine and some of the systems that, that of course, the Ukrainians need in their fight. Surely also one of the other key differences is that Israel was pretty much as prepared for this attack as you can be through intelligence briefings, through some pretty overt warnings from Iran. Sure. Although I don't think that the warnings are necessarily as important as uh, they're being <clears throat> drawn out to be, in fact. I say that because there are a couple of things on the Israeli side for context that need to be kept in mind. Uh, the first, Israel is already on a war footing. It's taking uh, rocket fire, drone fire across its borders nearly every day. Its air defenses are already on high alert. Iran's warnings aren't really going to change that. Of course, it takes uh, Israel faces ballistic missile and cruise missile fire from, from the Houthis as well on a pretty, pretty regular basis. Now, I think in terms of the Iranian telegraphing, it tried to create a tactical surprise by injecting uncertainty on when the strike would actually occur. But the Israelis were prepared. The Israelis knew that there would probably be some strike coming, given that they <clears throat> killed such a high level IRGC commander on April 1st. But also, like I said, they're on a war footing. And so I don't think the telegraphing of this attack, the warning of this attack is actually as important to its success through the air defense success as some are uh, putting out. You mentioned the original Israeli strike on the Iranian consulate in Damascus. Let's just rewind to there. What do you think Israel's motivation was with that strike? Sure. So the commander that they killed was a very high level uh, IRGC officer. He led the <clears throat> IRGC effort across Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine. Um, and he was actually one of the only non-Lebanese members of the Lebanese Hezbollah Shura Council and its Jihad Council, which is really important. It shows the level, this shows the role that that individual played in Lebanese Hezbollah. Now, of course, I think one of the important items for us uh, to keep in mind is how Iran is using Leban or using Syria rather to bring in weapons uh, in other in other systems to Lebanese Hezbollah. Israel has been hitting these shipments as they come through Syria for months now, and of course uh, the strike on April first was part of this effort as well to degrade Iran's ability to support its partner in Lebanon, Lebanese Hezbollah. Uh, just on that, I was speaking on Frontline only last week to Roger Boys, who's the Times diplomatic editor, and he made a very good point, which is that, of course, Russia essentially controls Syrian airspace. So why would it allow Israel to carry out this attack? I'm not sure. Uh, it depends on what uh, exactly which capabilities the Israelis used. In this case, I would be very surprised if the Israelis did not use the F-35, which is, of course, a stealth aircraft. In that case, there's a very good chance that Syria and Russia were not even necessarily aware that there were Israeli aircraft in the sky until the bombs were al already falling. <clears throat> and, and so in terms of the response we've seen from Iran, I mean, they had a number of options. Some people speculated they may attack a consulate and embassy of Israel, almost a kind of tit for tat response. Why do you think they chose to launch an attack on Israel itself? And how do you think it will be viewed 
in Iran, given that really it didn't have much um, effect in terms of in terms of damage? Yeah, I think that the Iranians were trying to have a trying to make a successful attack that they hoped would deter Israel from further uh, attacks on their commanders overseas, advising their uh, proxy and partner network in the axis of resistance. Of course, I don't think that theory is actually going to work. We're already seeing reports that Israel will <clears throat> retaliate against Iran for these attacks. Now, how it's going to play domestically, I'm not entirely sure. I think that in a lot of ways, it's actually more important for the Iranians to play this attack to its uh, foreign audience. By its foreign audience, I'm actually referring to its partners in the axis of resistance. So the Iranian backed militias throughout the region. It's important for Iran to kind of demonstrate its uh, Islamic resistance laurels against Israel in this way, especially in the wake of such a big attack, uh, such as the one on April 1st in Damascus. <clears throat> so it's almost a, a face saving exercise. Sure, in some in some degree, but I also think that they actually try to achieve uh, the effect of deterrence through this attack. I mean, has it not, though, been counterproductive from Iran's point of view? Because what you have seen in recent days is a solidifying of Western support for Israel, Western support that had been in recent weeks fraying somewhat, given some of the excesses of Israel's operations in Gaza. That was starting to ebb away, and some people even speculating that some Western nations may halt arms sales to Israel. And, and now it feels like Western support for Israel is as strong as ever. So from that perspective, maybe it's been counterproductive on Iran's part. I think certainly, certainly it has. I think this will definitely help Israel uh, with its aid package on Capitol Hill right now, um, you know, to secure some of these uh, munitions that it desperately needs having fought uh, a by Israeli standards, pretty long war uh, now in Gaza and against, you know, the rocket fire from Lebanese Hezbollah in the north. And of course, Israel does need those um, munitions to sustain this war effort. And maybe that was part of Israel's intention all along in terms of the strike it carried out on on the consulate. Yes, to assassinate this Iranian general, but also to remind the West that actually when they're taking the fight to Hamas in Gaza, they would say they're not just taking the fight to Hamas, they're taking the fight to Iran because Hamas is an Iranian proxy. And they, they wanted to remind Israel's Western allies of the wider threat posed by Iran. Perhaps, but I actually think that the attack in Damascus was important um, <clears throat> for Israel for military and strategic reason, reasons in the region. Of course, it helps Israel's allies in some ways because it does eliminate a very important commander from the board. And of course, Israel's allies will uh, not necessarily be disappointed by that individual's removal. But I will say that this has very discrete military and strategic effects for Israel and for the IDF. The commander that they killed is responsible for coordinating a lot of Iranian weapons shipments through Syria and into Lebanon. And of course, Israel has been very worried about Lebanese Hezbollah's presence on its northern border, a presence that Israel believes uh, could cause another northern October 7th to occur by Lebanese Hezbollah you know, coming across that border, which would be far more devastating than the Hamas attack on October 7th. <clears throat> I'm really keen to come back to Hezbollah in just a moment, Brian, because it's a really good point you make there about what they're doing in, in Lebanon and in, in the north of Israel currently. Uh, just in terms of how this plays domestically in Israel, does this now strengthen Netanyahu? I'm not sure. Uh, I, I'm not a expert on Israeli domestic politics, but I think it's important that there's going to be a lot of discussion in Israel in the coming days about how to respond to this attack and whether or not to listen to what the U.S. actually wants from Israel in their response to this attack. And so I think that will cause a lot of discussion, both within Netanyahu's government, but also from the opposition. Um, I actually saw today that the Israeli opposition leader Lapid said that <clears throat> Uh, Netanyahu was a existential threat to the Israeli state. So I think we're going to see a lot of jockeying in the Israeli domestic sphere uh, over the next few weeks in the wake of this attack and in the wake of Israel's retaliation against Iran. 
And talk me through what their options for retaliation are. I mean, clearly one of them is to do nothing, and that's what many in the West are urging them to do. But if they do decide to retaliate, what are their options? Sure. So I think there's three big options that the Israelis are probably looking at. Number one, uh, no response. That's kind of your uh, <clears throat> easy way out, for lack of a better term, when you're thinking about the U.S. alliance with Israel. The second is a significant strike targeting uh, Iranian proxies in the region, Hezbollah, uh, groups in Syria, groups in Iraq, uh, groups in obviously the Houthis in Yemen. Uh, and then the third option is a attack within Iran itself. This is the most challenging for logistical reasons. Uh, it is also the most politically challenging with the U.S.-Israel alliance uh, and Israel's relationship with the West at large. But I think that of those three, uh, the latter two seem to be more likely right now, given what we're seeing uh, come out in the form of leaks and, and indeed Israeli statements. And if, uh, if Israel do pursue one of those latter two options, would it then be inevitable that Iran would respond again in turn? It's hard to tell. I think we'd have to wait to see how the Iranians respond and what their rhetoric by their senior leaders actually points to. Because, of course, to your earlier point, uh, Iran's senior leaders in the wake of the April 1 attack had two big information lines. The first was, we will retaliate against Israel. The second was, United States, you need to stay out of our attack against Israel. <clears throat> Let's come on to Lebanese Hezbollah, because they conducted at least four attacks from southern Lebanon into northern Israel during and after the Iranian uh, attack on Israel. Do you expect that fighting between Hezbollah and Israel to intensify over coming days and weeks? Hard to tell. Lebanese Hezbollah has a lot of reasons not to get involved in the current fighting uh, that Israel is a part of. Hezbollah has been, of course, involved in this war. It has been launching rockets, uh, drones, and missiles across the northern border since October 7th. However, there is an almost informal agreement on how far Hezbollah will launch rockets into Israel and how deep into Lebanon Israel will strike uh, Lebanese Hezbollah. When Hezbollah launches too far into Israel and when Israel conducts airstrikes too deep into Lebanon, there is usually a response. Whether we will see an escalation in the coming days along that border, it's hard to tell. Uh, I think that Lebanese Hezbollah, for its part, is very worried about a war with Israel. It knows such a war would be extremely destructive to its organization and also uh, for the Lebanese people who are not looking for a war right now, who are struggling uh, to really make ends meet uh, due to the economic and political situation in Lebanon. And to what extent does Lebanese Hezbollah have some level of operational independence from Iran. I mean, very often this, this term proxy gets thrown around. Hezbollah's a proxy, Hamas is a proxy, the Houthis are a proxy. How much is that true? It's, it's complicated when it comes to Lebanese Hezbollah, but I think there's one thing that needs to be made extremely clear. The Lebanese Hezbollah Secretary General, Hassan Nasrallah, is a believer in Iranian, Iran's uh, theological teachings. Uh, Nasrallah is a follower of the Iranian supreme leader and answers, indeed, to the Iranian supreme leader. This being said, he does have some flexibility and some uh, room to maneuver. He can withstand Iranian pressure to a certain point to become involved in the fighting against Israel. Uh, and Iran also, for its part, does not probably does not want Hezbollah to become involved in the fighting because Hezbollah is such a strong partner for Iran and really allows Iran to increase its deterrence against Israel, given that Hezbollah controls a lot of missiles and drones that it can launch against critical Israeli infrastructure, uh, such as that of Haifa, with little or no warning. <clears throat> How strong is the regime in Tehran at the moment? Um, Hard to tell. I think, uh, you know, obviously there are big there's always the risk of protests and any large protests threaten the regime. We saw that uh, just last year, just about a year and a half ago now. But, you know, I think that uh, over the long term, the regime has some hard choices to make in terms of its economy. Its people are frustrated about the regime's investment overseas, 
versus in the Iranian uh, economy. Of course, the regime itself sees its investment overseas as a way to export its revolution and to protect its revolution. Uh, however, of course, in the day-to-day -day life of your average Iranian, those concerns uh, feel much less important. <clears throat> and, and to what extent are the decisions that the regime make in terms of its operations in Israel or with regards to Israel informed by domestic considerations? They're certainly informed by domestic considerations, especially when it comes to regime stakeholders. When you see discussions within the regime, as we did over the last couple of weeks, about what kind of attack to conduct, you do see uh, the hardliners in the regime advocating for a more extensive strike, the more moderate figures obviously uh, advocating for a, a less, uh, less large, a, a smaller strike. Um, now, of course, <clears throat> in the end, I think that the hardliners in Iran are becoming increasingly, increasingly uh, stronger as the years go on, as the regime kind of sidelines some of its more moderate and reformist voices. And I suppose that also goes a long way to explaining the way that Iran has, has attempted to present the events of Saturday night to kind of signal it as a victory internally, despite the fact a lot of people would say, actually, it was a it was a victory almost for Israel, given um, the strength of their air defences. Sure, I, I agree. I think uh, it was certainly a failure for Iran, but I, I want to note that it's not quite a success for Israel either. There were several ballistic missiles that got through. That is a very dangerous proposition for Israel. On the one hand, uh, these are large ballistic missiles. Of course, they hit in unpopulated desert areas near military bases, but should they hit in the center of Tel Aviv or the center of Haifa, they could cause significant damage and significant loss of life. And of course, this also drives home the dangers of Iran's nuclear program and how, uh, of course, any of these missiles could be fitted with nuclear warheads. And in that case, you cannot let a single a nuclear nuclear armed missile through your air defenses. <clears throat> and, and just talk me through, Brian, the wider significance of the fact it feels now like what we've had for the last few months, certainly for years, I suppose, which is a kind of proxy war between Iran and Israel has now come out of the shadows almost. And it, and it feels like a far more direct conflict now between Israel and Iran. What is the significance of that longer term? Sure. It's hard to exactly ascertain what I think the long-term significance will be. I think we'll have a better idea once the Israeli retaliation against Iran occurs, figuring out what fashion that actually comes in, how that actually looks, and of course, how Iran decides to respond to it. I think there has been some discussion about how Iran for years hasn't directly attacked other countries, but I do want to note this isn't necessarily true. Just in the last you know, three or four months, we've seen Iran launch missiles into Pakistan, launch missiles into Iraq. And so I think that uh, we have to keep this in mind as we're talking about this, because Iran is becoming increasingly confident in its uh, missile and drone capabilities, and it's becoming increasingly willing uh, to use those capabilities against other states in the region. And you know, to that point, thinking about how this will play in the <clears throat> Gulf states, especially Saudi Arabia, who has been, of course, attacked directly by Iran with missiles and drones in the past. <clears throat> and how would you assess the, the risk of, of wider escalation? I mean, the big fear a lot of people talk about is that the US become directly involved in essentially a war with Iran. How do you assess that risk at the moment, Brian? I think that the Biden administration is doing all that it can to avoid that risk. Um, and I think, honestly, the Iranians, though this strike was aimed to penetrate Israeli air defenses, it was still a relatively limited strike. As I mentioned a few years ago or a few minutes ago, they could have tried to comment or tried to target Tel Aviv or Haifa. But of course, they targeted military targets, military bases in the desert. So <clears throat> I think that both sides are carefully walking a tightrope here. Of course, accidents can happen. Mistakes can be made. But I think all sides are trying to uh, really avoid the risk of a full on war because of the damage that that would cause, not just Israel, uh, but also Iran. <clears throat> and, and when do you think if Israel does choose to retaliate, what sort of time scale are we talking about? Could it happen within days? Would it be weeks or are they going to hold fire for, for, for the time being? I would expect days, given the responses of the Israeli officials on the issue so far, uh, should it occur. 
I think that <clears throat> there are still going to be some discussions to be had within the Israeli war cabinet on how exactly to calibrate this strike to ensure um, it does not really expand the conflict or damage the alliance with the United States. And I expect, uh, I hope, the Israelis will work uh, to gain the U.S.'s approval. Of course, the sooner the Israelis conduct this attack, the easier it may be to get approval, both from the United States, um, but at least the support of the rest of uh, the West, including the United Kingdom and France in particular. <clears throat> And just finally, Brian, you are, of course, an expert on Iran and the Middle East more broadly. Is this the most volatile you've known the region in a generation? I wouldn't say volatile, but I would like to kind of point back to the discussions had prior to October 7th, which were along the lines of this is the most peaceful uh, the Middle East has been in decades. And that's certainly not true. And, you know, today we're seeing the risks and the danger posed by uh, Iran and its networks of proxies and partners throughout the region. You know, last night's strike targeted Israel, but <clears throat> in the future, those same capabilities could be brought to bear against U.S. basing structures in Qatar, in the UAE, and elsewhere. And I think it's important uh, to have that context in mind, because while Israel is a thousand kilometers away from the Iranian border, there is a ton of time to intercept drones and missiles on their way. U.S. bases in Qatar and the UAE don't have that advantage. They're not a thousand kilometers away. And the flight time for some of those missiles is measured in minutes and less than 10 minutes in some circumstances. So that really increases the risk and is always something uh, to keep in mind as we navigate this threat going forward. Brian, we really appreciate your insights and your expertise. Thank you so much for joining us on Frontline today. Yep, thank you. Thank you for watching Frontline for Times Radio. For more on global security and the war in Ukraine, you can listen to Times Radio, take out a digital subscription to The Times and click subscribe on our YouTube channel.